This podcast is Entel Enhanced. To see pictures, articles and links of what's being discussed, download the Entel app. Hello, welcome to the Big Scuba Show. All right, well, I'm Homer Hickam and I'm happy to be here on the Big Scuba podcast with uh, Gemma and Ian. Welcome back to the Big Scooper Podcast. We are your hosts, Gemma and Ian. Before we get cracking with today's episode, we just want to make sure you have hit that follow button or the subscribe button, depending on what platform you are listening on. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts and you enjoy what you're going to hear today, we would really appreciate it if you can leave a review and a five-star rating. So now that's out of the way, we just want to say welcome and thank you for all tuning in. And now it's time to dive into today's episode. Hello everyone, welcome back to the Big Scuba Podcast. This is Ian and I'm your <laughs> co-host and with me is... Gemma, I'm the other co-host. The other co-host, <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, welcome back and uh, we're kind of into the flow of these, aren't we? Yeah, this is 116th episode. There we go. If you're wondering what it's all about, well, we're, we're all about diving, fun under the water, talking to fun people who love diving and explorers and, and we... Do a fair bit on the water as well. We do, yeah. Chance. And people that have got a keen interest in marine conservation and looking after this planet. We bring you news and guests. And fun, hopefully. From the water <laughs> world, yes. Coming up on this fun episode, we've got, we talk about uh, what we've been up to. Yep. Um, Hyperbaric Awareness Month coming up. That's coming up in May. Yeah. Uh, there's been a liverboard fire, so a little bit of a serious chat about liverboard. Uh, Ross Kemp has been in the water. He has so diving. Talk, talk about um, his uh, new show called The Shipwreck Treasure Hunting on Sky History. Um, also, we've got a guest for you. We try and bring in a guest nearly ep- every episode, don't we? Yeah, his name is Homer Hickam. Yeah, who's an author and diver. Mm-hmm. Um, also, had quite a bit of, to do with sort of NASA and things like that in his past. He has, he's quite a colourful. Yeah, chap. quite quite interesting. And um, so, uh, what should we talk about? Should we talk about what we've been up to? Yes. How's yeah. the, what's the life in the Coast Guard been like this week? Uh, we didn't have training because it was bank holiday, but we had an ordnance job this week. An ordnance. <laughs> so yeah, the there was something found on beach here, right. and uh, we just had to go and cordon it off. Well, and keep yeah public away from it while we waited for the. Uh, bomb people to come along and look at it and, oh, right. uh, was it our friends from Portsmouth no I don't think so I think they were from Colchester right so, okay, yeah okay. so but they had a look at it and it wasn't anything um of any importance or uh, danger so they do chuck it all back <laughs> I don't know what can't they do <laughs> you don't need this chuck it back in. so but that was the first exercise or the first job that I'd done that involved ordnance so all right yeah. cool yeah cool. so I had a bit of a wander on the beach to do a bit of a sweep and a search and make sure there's yeah. nothing else cup tea trip to McDonald's no <laughs> other fast food retailers are available that's not, not what that happens. you see coast guard or ambulance for that matter at, at, sitting at the uh <laughs> I did say that, everybody. <laughs> anyway, saying. what else have we been up to? Been um, swimming? S- swimming, yeah, we've been in the pool at Crystal Seas. We've been doing some work with our new fancy camera, we which have. has been really yeah. cool. Um, so we've got a Olympus Tough TG6, mm-hmm. and uh, we're getting used to that, aren't you? Yes. Well, you're going to be the main one behind yep. that, aren't you? Yeah. We've got the housing, the underwater housing as well, so yeah. you're just getting used to... So I've been getting the grips with this new drone. Yeah, yeah, we've yeah, got, got little projects. Yeah, and um, obviously we're still using the power lens as well, um, that we've got the Fakrita. Um, but the Olympus TG6 is going to be like your baby, so to speak. It is, yeah. And so far, it's uh, really straightforward to use. Yes, yeah. yes. And, uh, and even Scuba Honey was getting in on She was, that. yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah, that's been really good. Uh, I tried out some free diving fins made by Hydronaut Pro. These fins are. They're very um, smart, aren't they? They are. Very swish. And even got my name on the bag, which is very kind of them. Um, so, yeah, it's good to get them in. I've not tried uh, free diving fins before. No. How did they feel? Really good. Yeah, really yeah, quite like them. You look actually. quite, yeah, you know, yeah. And you <laughs> free diving. Really, you can really power your way forward in these. So, uh, 
hopefully in the sea uh, in the you know over the summer it'd be good to get them yeah and try them in in anger so to speak yeah and uh, maybe a bit more depth yeah yeah so uh, but i want to try them out in the pool see what they're like and uh, that was really good um apart from that it's been the usual thing with crossfit we've got this european championship still going on uh with tech uh 22.3 um so got that to do and the results will be out next week yes yeah. all being well so hoping for a good for a good uh finish on yeah, that really in sure. the novice category um so i'll share about that once it's all done yeah and we've done our 5k run today our normal sunday yeah, it was a tough one today actually yeah, we did well yeah Still... strong east wind it was a bit yeah so I've uh, got it done there, didn't we? 30, 30 minutes? Right? Yeah. So uh, yeah. Not, not too bad Main time thing is, that. we get out, do keep moving and get some exercise in. Yeah, yeah, it all helps towards the old uh, dive of fitness. Okay, what else? Uh, so we mentioned about hyperbaric awareness. Now, you're probably wondering, what on earth are they talking about? May is being designated as the hyperbaric awareness month. Uh, as a campaign which aims to spread national and statewide and local awareness about the hyperbaric chamber treatments. Which, That's good. You know, yeah. As a diver, um, whether you're a commercial diver, recreational diver, we sometimes do need these to yeah. recover. Well, it's good for any new divers as well to have an awareness of what the hyperbaric chamber actually means. And you means. should be aware where your local, mm. you know, in this part of the region are... Our local chambers so based at our local hospital here, mm -hmm. at St. Paget's in, in um, Galston. Yes, yeah. You know, uh, and that's where they take in uh, people from the diving community, whether it's commercial or not, yeah. um, even who are offshore, based offshore, they'll be helicoptered yeah, straight, straight to there, yeah, there a, for, for treatment. There's a helipad at the hospital, so yeah, it's used for. And as a Coast Guard, you would be yeah, involved. I'd be there, in that, yes, right? yes. As, uh, yeah. as that. So. Um, you know, it's a, it helps to, uh, it's just a, you know, it's a month that's going to be used to bring awareness to that. Yeah. So look out for that. There'll be posts about that. Yeah, we'll keep it on uh, the social media. By the media. hyperbaricaware.com website and us. And I'm sure other diving mm. uh, centres and that will be sharing about that as well because it's all really, really important. It you is, know, yeah, for everybody's health. You should know where that is um, if you're diving. Um Okay, there's been a fire, um, really sad to see, uh, and our thoughts go out to scuba scene, liverboard, you know, um, it's horrific to see, you know, a beautiful yeah, ship like that. It was a bit, um, yeah, sc scary seeing something like that happen. But it does but, happen, yeah. you know, you know, it's not the first, sadly probably won't be the last. It sounds like on this occasion it's an engine fire. Yeah. The good news is everybody got off, and mm -hmm. uh, but it does make you think, well, you know, if it does happen, and I've been on a liverboard, uh, you've got that experience still to come. You know, what should you be aware of? You know, what what is there any precautions you you can well, make? Well, and there also need to be certain things in place for you to feel you happy know, and safe. When you when you, if you go on a, a, a liverboard, and, and let's face it, we will. It's always best to go on a liverboard from a reputable, well-known company. Yeah. In, there's lo there's loads out there, and I'm not going to list the names, but I've been on one, and one of the first things that you have is a, a video or a brief which tells you about the health and safety of, and the protocols of being on a liverboard. Because there's fact you're going to be on a boat for a week living. Mm, it's a long and, time, isn't it? Yeah, and there's things you need to be aware of, mm. you know, because there is things you you you, you should know about being on ship for a week yeah it's, it's not different. like it's cruise ship size it is quite a small environment isn't right. it yeah. yeah absolutely yeah there's all the fun elements you know about being on the dinner board that's great but there is a there's some seriousness which you do have to think right okay you know what would happen if a fire alarm went off you know and potentially you could be in your cabin asleep mm. Mm -hmm. you could be just back from a from a dive you know, what things do you do? What Are you going to grab your BCD first? Or are you going to grab your life jacket? Yeah. You know, and depending on the fire, depending on where you are, yeah. could you determine which one you grab? Because yeah. let's face it, you're going to grab whatever comes with whatever life, life saving to equipment to keep you afloat. You know, yeah. if my BCD is at hand and I can manually inflate that and I know that's fine, I'm going to grab that first. Mm. 
rather mm. than risk going in the fire, you know, because you don't. You, you grab whatever's at the nearest. Yes. And another little good point, and I think this came out from a, another fire which happened a couple of years ago, was that when you get on, get in your cabin, a good thing to take with you is a small dry bag. Yeah, you've said about this before, yeah. to pop your passport in and just Because so if you're in your cabin and the fire alarm goes off, you ain't got time to grab stuff. You mm. haven't. It's a case of you get up on deck, you know, and you, and wherever the the the, the liveboard captain and crew say where the designated place to where meet you muster, is, yeah. where you muster, you know, your point is you you get there if that's safe to do so. Mm. Um, and if you can grab on the way out your small dry bag which contains your passport. Mm. Maybe it's got a bit of cash in there, but you can grab that, you, you're away, you know, it's just going to save a lot of bother. Obviously, caveat in this is the re is you get out of cabin ASAP. Yeah, you know, but that, that's saying, just a little checklist, know, I think. It is, you know, if there's something you can grab, uh, you know, on the way out as you evacuate, yeah. then you, you know, it's good, it's yeah. a good pro thing to do is when you store your passport or whatever, wherever you, you know, anything particular, maybe insurance stocks, because um, you've got to have insurance if you go on live abroad, if you go diving abroad, um, you know, you got that at hand. Yeah, just saves a little bit of a few seconds, extra hassle. Yeah, does it certainly does. So, uh, but our thoughts go out to everybody, and it's a shame to see a beautiful boat like that, you know, end up in such a state. So, mm. um, but you know, hopefully. We'll see scuba scene liverboards back uh, yes. where they belong very soon on the, on the water again. So yeah, yeah. That's that. Okay, right. Let's talk about our next subject, which is. I'm Ross Kemp, and I've always had an affinity with the sea, and in particular shipwrecks. Now, Ross, he's got a new exciting uh, episode, well, series out called. Uh, shipwreck treasure hunting which is on sky history channel yeah and we've um both had a little look at a couple of episodes yeah and i i'm a bit surprised I'm a bit, yeah. <laughs> so i've seen good and bad uh comments about this show from the diving community which is fair and i think there is some fair comments mm -hmm. on both sides of the fence and i personally think good on ross but, yeah. And I'll I'll come to this in a minute. I think um, you can say from the diving point of view, you can look at things and think, mm, maybe this, maybe that, you know. There what do you mean, things. made for TV? Or? Yeah, a little bit, mm. a little bit. And I think, you know, you can see that um, Ross is probably not particularly that experienced as a diver. I don't know. I no. don't know the facts. We know who trained Ross, you know. We only know what we can see on the screen. And we don't we know. We know he's been to some great people for training mm. and gaining experience. And we know the people who he's dived with certainly uh, wouldn't have signed him off unless he's safe to dive. No, absolutely not. Um, because, you know, and I wouldn't, you know, I want to give them respect as well in, in this. Um, and I have, to, and we see. That you know he's been diving with Emily Turn, you know, brilliant diver, tons of experience at, up at Scabba and diving. Uh, we had Emily on last year, Near, uh, a episode year ago, sixty-six. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that was a really great um, interview, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, talking about the Orkney Islands, talking about diving at Scabba, why that should be on every diver's bucket list, list. bucket list to go and dive. Why that is a beautiful, and not even for diving. You know, the Orkney Orkney Islands offer great experience for families to go and experience and why you should go there on holiday yeah all yeah. right um you know and it kind of feels like there's a buck coming in <laughs> but they're in not really I, I i i really enjoyed the show yeah it was quite dramatic in places yeah, and it, yeah it's yeah, typical late tv there is isn't yeah. there? you know there is some bits and pieces on and how many times we watch films and i think of 47 meters down we're so unrealistic it's unbelievable but it's not, you know, he's, he's diving in a great uh, dry suit. Mm -hmm. you know, O3. O3, we, we love O3, we love their dry suits. 
um, and the dry suits are out there as well we know um, but you know he's been trained by some really great people he's diving in some right really great gear um, I'm jealous of the full face mask yeah that looks really good I think it? I, you know, I think that's something for us that we need to uh, get into at some stage and I think uh, he's done a really good show to be honest at yeah. the series and do you know what yeah you can say well you know uh, I, I, reading some of the comments people have picked holes in some of the some things about the show and I think well yeah maybe maybe but do you but, know what if he, if Ross has gone through this training you know he's put his life at risk to make great TV show and it yeah, everybody's which is not easy ev- some of them dives are not easy just face it you know if you're in a if you get hit by a current you know one on the first series first episode on that wreck he's diving this he dives through the f2 he dives on the second dive the tobacco where you can get really strong currents you know and emily says uh as in part of that part of that dive brief mm. she said you know, there's a they're at get, slack you get a slack of 20 minutes that's not long and i've been hit by currents like a lot of other divers i have you've got no chance the only thing you can do is turn around and go back with it and yeah and watch out for all the sharp objects which are in a wreck yeah you yeah know? and I, I say fair play to ross camp you know uh for bringing diving again to the mainstream yeah to yeah general tv and there's always going to be critics good and bad and i'm everybody... pretty sure right if facebook and instagram was going in the 60s when Jack Cousteau was diving and making great TV films, there would have been divers tapping away on their keyboard going, oh, well, he shouldn't be doing that. But that's, that. it's a fact of life, isn't it? It is a fact of life, you know, but I think on the mainstream, he's done a really good show. Emily has uh, done a really good thing with her with her boat by taking him around to some good wrecks. Yeah, good partner and supporting. Yeah. And look out for her dive boat, which is a really great dive boat, MV Huskin. And look out for mvhuskin.com. You know, and, you know, if Ross Kemp's TV show uh, sparks an interest in one person who goes, you know what, that diving lark, I'm going to give it a go. I'm giving that a go. Yeah. And makes a phone call to their local dive set and say, I've seen Ross Kemp's show. I'd love to learn how to dive. Yeah, that's it. Then that's got to be worth it. Yeah, and there's not that many programmes you see where you can see a diver, you know. In the UK, Mm. you know, we've got loads of American friends, you know, great. But in the UK, seeing a UK diver going around UK wrecks, highlighting what it's like underwater and bringing that to the masses. Yeah, really good. Ross Kemp, thank you very much. Yeah. You know, and, I, and I should be sitting down watching the rest of it. Yeah, yeah, I think we yeah, definitely will finish watching the series because it's so, going to, yeah. it's all, you know, and it helps us, you know, new divers as well. It's, you know, a bit more experience under there. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. I, I really enjoyed it. So, uh, there we go. Leave it, you know, some, that might be controversial and so be it. Well, let us know your opinion. Yeah, let us know. Do you like it? Do you, you know, what do you think? Mm. Okay, um, what's the anything else we've got to talk about apart from that? I think that's about it, I think. Yep, I, I think so. So, so we've got... should we dial back and sit back and chat to Homer? Homer Hickam. Great name. <laughs> Great name. <laughs> yeah, and he's very entertaining. And uh, yeah, you're going to hear all about his scuba journey. And I didn't go, don't, at any <laughs> stage. <laughs> right, so here's our guest. <laughs> Great. Okay, that's super. So, um, Homer, welcome to the Big Scuba podcast. It's uh, very nice to have you. Um, so, for our audience, um, would you like to tell us a bit about yourself and who you are? Well, right. Um, so, I'm probably best known for writing a book uh, titled Rocket Boys. And from that, they made the movie October Sky, and uh, Jake Gyllenhaal played me, uh, and that, that concerned the time when I grew up in um, the coal fields of West Virginia, and uh, in the late 1950s, and um, after the Russians launched Sputnik, I was um, our world's first Earth satellite, 
I was inspired by that and started building rockets that led to going to the National Science Fair and winning a gold medal and all that. Wow. However, one of the things that's not known about me should be is the fact that um, I started scuba diving in 1973, uh, became a scuba instructor in 1974, and I started researching the great battle along our East Coast uh, during World War II against the German U-boats. Mm -hmm. And uh, that ultimately led in 1989 to publication of my first book uh, called Torpedo Junction which uh, was a result of all those many, many years of research and also diving on the U-boat wrecks off of North Carolina and all the great wrecks there. Uh, and during all of that, I also had a career with NASA training the first uh, Japanese astronauts and uh, working with the Europeans and the Russians on the International Space Station and also working underwater in the big neutral buoyancy simulator here in Huntsville uh, 40 feet deep, 75 feet across, and training the astronauts how to go up and repair the Hubble Space Telescope. So my mm -hmm. uh, scuba career, my writing career, and my uh, space career all kind of merged together. Mm. Wow. So what made you actually start to learn scuba diving? Was it because of your career or was it just something that you wanted to do? Well, <clears throat> Uh, I'm a Vietnam veteran, and so uh, I was over there during the worst part of the Vietnam War. I was in the 4th Infantry Division and came back uh, uh, in 1968, and um, I, I had a job. I was an engineer, but um, I really just felt like that, uh, that I, was, I was at loose ends. I wasn't really passionate about much, and um, we, um, I got assigned to Puerto Rico, and uh, went down there and um, of course, uh, beautiful ocean around Puerto Rico, um, rather deep. And um, I got to know a couple of, uh, of uh, American Navy ensigns down there who were scuba divers and they convinced me that they could train me how to scuba dive. And so I went out on a ridiculous little rubber boat that they had a little Zodiac. And um, I should have noticed they only had one set of scuba gear um, but um, they basically told me everything wrong to do, pitched me overboard with this, and um, uh, I, I, did, uh, I did survive somehow, but, <laughs> but I also saw a fish, and I thought, wow, this is great. I saw one fish. <laughs> so, uh, so I thought, I came back, and they, they were kind of heavy drinkers, and they were pretty well, they were asleep on this little Zodiac and hardly knew that I was there, and I stripped off all my gear, lost it all. But I came back on board that little Zodiac and I suddenly just had this passion to learn how to properly scuba dive. So um, after my tour in, in Puerto Rico, I came back and started working for the Army Missile Command here in Huntsville, Alabama, and met a young uh, man by the name of uh, Cliff McClure, who turned out to uh, own a little tiny dive shop called Aquaspace. And he was an instructor and I, I started uh, working with him. And so um, uh, he taught me the correct way to scuba dive. He taught me uh, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, technical stuff um, about decompression sickness and uh, how to disassemble a regulator and put it back together again. So he really just taught me all the nuts and bolts of uh, diving. And uh, I just fell in love with it and uh, became a, an instructor for him. And um, then I heard about the U-boat the wrecks that were found off of North Carolina. And I was writing, freelance writing by then for a number of uh, magazines about my vacations as a scuba diver. And that, um, that led to one of those magazines asking me to go up to North Carolina and see if I could get aboard uh, this U-boat wreck that was discovered called the U-352, which I did, and uh, that uh, it all just extrapolated from there. Yeah, wow. So did you go into like sort of technical diving, rebreathers or? Well, I've used rebreathers, but at that time, uh, we didn't have uh, nitrox uh, really available. Uh, so essentially, we were pushing up the edge 
uh, against the edge of our knowledge on uh, decompression. We had the Navy tables, um, the US Navy tables that were designed, um, really they just, the way they figured out uh, how, how long you could stay underwater without getting into decompression or getting into it was essentially bending their sailors. And so, um, so that's, that's the way that all that was developed. And so we used the Navy tables uh, religiously. We were diving in about uh, 30 to 40 meters of water to work on the U-boats. So as you know, that you're on, you can't be down there very long on air mm -hmm. unless you're willing to go into decompression. And so we were willing to do that which meant a lot of hanging uh, from the anchor line, which was bouncing up and down. And so it was pretty uh, dangerous uh, diving and we were really pushing the envelope uh, of, our, of our knowledge. There was a, a crude decompression meter at that time. It was made in Italy. Um, it, we called it a bendomatic. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was essentially an analog device that had a little piece of ceramic in it that were, and a bag of air that, uh, depending on how long you were down, it would cause a needle to move and you wanted to keep it out of the red. And so it was kind of the backup. If you forgot everything else, you at least had the bendomatic to check. Um, they used to laugh and say, what, what's the first thing that the medics do when you arrive at the decompression chamber? First, they take off your bendomatic, and, <laughs> and then they treat you. <laughs> wow. So yeah, we were really pushing the envelope on it. Yeah, those are really early days with uh, with the tables and that, and uh, that must have been looking back uh, really exciting to be part of that and that development. In you know, although everyone's got you know a lot of people who dive now have got dive computers, but. Um, you know, we still teach tables today, and it's great that you know you're a part of that and uh, seeing them right at those early days. Yeah, and um, of course, um, in, in when I first started out, most of the instruction, depending on the instructor you had, but most of the instructors I ran across really uh, were into training uh, in a very technical way and giving you a lot of detail. Uh, on, again, how your regulator works so that if you were out in the field, there, there wasn't any dive shops around <laughs> that you could strip that regulator and put it back together again and fix it. Um, and um, also just very knowledgeable of the physiology of what was happening in terms of the nitrogen getting absorbed into your tissues and also making sure that you understood that everybody wasn't the same that depending on your weight, depending on your age and so on, the Navy tables weren't, uh, weren't exactly going to protect you every time. So you better be very, very conservative with them. The Navy tables were built uh, around young, uh, healthy males. And if you weren't a young, healthy male, uh, a 19, young, healthy 1940s and 1950s male, <laughs> I might add, these tables may or may not exactly apply. So you need to yeah. move to use them very conservatively. The deepest, whatever your deepest depth was, you should, you should decide that that's your bottom time. It doesn't matter that you spend a lot of time in a shallower depth, that's your bottom time. And that was the way that we used them conservatively and understood that, um, that uh, also sometimes symptomatically after a dive where you feel just extra tired, you might actually be bent, even though you're not feeling yeah. any pain or anything else. And you better, better be very conservative about you do, uh, next. And you also better have some oxygen around all the time, um, even when you don't think you're going to be diving in a, uh, in a situation where you might get decompression sickness. Mm -hmm. yeah. It must be amazing now to look back on those days to where we are now. Well, it is. And uh, of course, uh, we also uh, have to uh, tell you the story of, about uh, working in the big neutral buoyancy simulator, which was 40 feet deep. And 40 feet deep, you would think, well, uh, you could stay down there, what, 200 minutes, I think it is, 40 feet. Um, and uh, so you're not going to have to worry about getting decompression sickness there. But in fact, I did get 
decompression sickness not in there but as a result of it and again it was just a matter of um, not knowing really pushing up the edge uh, against the edge of the envelope when it comes to decompression sickness when we uh, went up and repaired the Hubble Space Telescope uh, one of the requirements of Story Musgrave the, the lead astronaut on that was that he wanted to have end-to-end -end runs which meant six hours underwater at 40 feet. So how are you gonna do that? Well, that was the first time that we started using nitrox. We really kind of developed that, uh, the use of it there. It was in the, the late, uh, early 1990s. Um, and uh, so we started pumping nitrox down to the astronauts, which was a little bit dangerous because they're under really high pressure not only the pressure of the water, the surrounding water, but also the pressure of the suit itself, which is another five PSI. So um, theoretically, they could catch on fire <laughs> with a high oxygen content. So uh, we had to be really, really careful with that. But that meant we, the divers, we were on air. And so we were making six hour runs, which meant that we were going back and forth, back and forth, trying to decompress a little bit and going back to where we did this so many days of uh, uh, and, and some of the some of the fellows were complaining of joint pain and and yeah, also yeah. being really really tired and um, but uh, what happened to me was that I was I didn't have any joint pain but I, I was feeling really really tired and it just turned out that I had a vacation scheduled in Honduras and so right in the midst of that I took my vacation and went down to Honduras and made a dive down to 80 feet and was well within the decompression limits but I got I got hit I got hit really hard and uh, it was a type 2 decompression uh, hit a spinal cord hit in oh, Honduras so how long did it take <laughs> to get over that well I had no um, I had no oxygen I had there was no chamber anywhere but fortunately the divers uh, accident network alert network as it was called then in North Carolina existed and I had its number I was able from ship to shore ship to shore to get hold of them they essentially said you got to get on oxygen Homer and get to a chamber as quickly yeah. as you can and which I did by getting using the air out of the, or the oxygen out of a welding tank of all things oh, wow. Wow. so uh things must <laughs> exactly. And so uh, I did uh, get well enough to be flown back to here to, in Huntsville, Alabama and into the chamber at, uh, ironically enough, right at the neutral buoyancy simulator. So uh, I recovered. But uh, again, um, ever since I've been very, very careful. I don't go down really deep. I go down usually 40, 50 feet is mm -hmm. as deep as I ever want to go again. Yeah. So, yeah. so you, once, you're, once you're bent, you got to be really careful. Yeah. So. Do you still dive? I do. I do. We have a home in, uh, in uh, St. John, the Virgin Islands. Wow. And uh, so I go down there several, several times a year. Again, that's um, uh, relatively shallow diving. Um, you know, you know how the reef structure is. The reefs are really uh, anything below 30, 40, 50 feet are the reef kind of dies out at that yeah. point. So you yeah. really don't need to go down any deeper. I also dive over at the uh, space camp here in Huntsville. Uh, uh, we have a um, 25 foot deep tank there uh, called the underwater astronaut trainer. And so I'm on the board uh, space camp. So I go out there and dive. Uh, <laughs> Awesome. Every <laughs> well, it's good though isn't it because like um the ma you find the magic in your dive and it doesn't matter how deep you are you know whether you're four meters where you're 10 meters um it's your dive and uh we we all love diving because of that in, in seeing the fish seeing the reefs and it's great that you've come through that and you've had that close shave and you're still getting in the water and enjoying it and that's what's important isn't it it's not the yeah, well, you, you know, and I get to tell cautionary tales like I'm yeah. telling right now to everybody else, you know, um, I, I think quite often uh, when we're young and healthy, we think we're indestructible and yeah. nothing can ever happen to us. Uh, but you definitely 
again, diving is a technical sport. It's a beautiful sport. This feeling of weightlessness. People are always talking about, oh my God, Homer, wouldn't you love to go into space where you can be weightless? I've been weightless tens of thousands of hours. So yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> so no, that's not the part of space that I would look forward to. It would be looking out the window, actually. Um, but um, but yeah, ultimately diving is a beautiful sport, but it's also a technical sport and you've got yeah. to keep track of it. You are doing something that, uh, that um, requires care and you're breathing air at a higher pressure than what the, uh, we are evolved to breathe. And interestingly enough, though, we can do it. Uh, we can clear our ears. I mean, thank goodness we don't have any enclosed air spaces in our body. <laughs> not, we can all, we can all, well, unless you have a cold and, and the sinuses uh, tell you. Um, so, uh, so we, the human body does very, very well underwater, except for that. Uh, well, you know, two things, never, never hold your breath, right? For obvious reasons, because Boyle's law, which yeah. we really used to harp on Boyle's law when we trained i've trained thousands of divers and i don't let them get away from Boyle's well law i don't care what the the scuba agency says about don't scare them because we want to sell them equipment right <laughs> uh, it's like no pressure and volume vary inversely if you hold your breath at 33 feet which is one atmosphere you've actually when you come up you're going to have twice the amount of pressure oh. or volume in your lungs and it's going to be forced it's going to be ugly okay yeah, don't do that I want to, I have to scare them a little bit, just a little bit, you know, That's true, though, isn't um, it? so I do that. And um, also, but it's interesting, very interesting that 80% of our atmosphere is nitrogen, which turns out to be for no apparent reason, soluble in our blood and our tissue. <laughs> and so, uh, so we need to be aware of that. And that's going to come out in some way, either slowly or rapidly. So yeah. it's, you know, your choice. And so you need to understand that. And I also think that's very important to kind of know how your regulator works, you know? Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> yeah. Yeah. all yeah. the things. And understanding, having that awareness rather than just do all your courses and not know all this, you do need to know it to make your life safer and appreciate your diving. Yeah. I think. Yeah. 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 I mean, if you have all that you know, I think it's one of the reasons that sometimes we see divers so uncomfortable underwater because they don't understand really, um, and they know that they don't understand, and they've got all this equipment strapped on them, and they feel very uneasy about it, and they don't know much except, you know, um, it, it, the hardest thing sometimes to teach a diver is to, is to clear their mask, which is interesting to me too. Yeah. Um, I mean, we we trained a lot of really uh, young people um, over at the underwater astronaut trainer at space camp. And I kind of pioneered that back in the late 1980s, um, how to take a teenager who has never even snorkeled down to 25 feet deep within an hour. How do you do that safely? Well, first you terrify them. <laughs> you have to. <laughs> and then. A six uh, Patty manual. Yeah, well, you know, you, you, right. I mean, Patty would just, oh, no. Can't get it. But it's like, if, all right, everything you've done here at Space Camp has been a simulation until tonight. If you don't do exactly, precisely what I tell you to do, you are going to, now hear this, you are going to die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if you learn tech diving, that's on that first page. Isn't it? And so the little, you know, before that, they're joking around. Now the eyes get really big, unless they're Australian, then they go, eh, I don't care. So, um, so, <laughs> so um, yeah, the Aussies are hard to teach, but um, the Chinese are very easy. The Japanese are very easy. Americans, eh, that's because they like to hard. learn. Aussies are impossible. But anyway, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, so what's, but what's interesting to me is that in a lot of cases, these young people have never had to control their bodies in any way. Yeah. So what's the hardest thing for them to learn? Uh, and this is true for a lot of students. It's how to clear your mask. Because all of a sudden, you have to breathe through your mouth and exhale through your nose. Yeah. And if you've never even thought about that, that turns out to be a difficult thing for some people to figure out. 
and they'll just blow and blow and blow through their mouth and the mask is <laughs> filling up. Yeah. So yeah, it's interesting to me, uh, the different aspects of instruction. And that's why I like being a scuba instructor. It was just great um, seeing the way the, the different people react. But I really, ultimately, trust me, I don't go tell normal. Uh, when I used to teach scuba, I'm retired now, but when I used to teach just normally, I didn't go in and try to terrify them like I had to do <laughs> <laughs> with these teenagers. <laughs> See if they sink or swim. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the ocean, as you, as you guys well know, is so beautiful. And uh, especially when you get down to the tropics. Mm. I've never tried to dive around the UK. I don't know what that would be like. I imagine rather rough and uh, the water is no, a little... No, honestly, gray, so. sometimes it's nice. And um, it you know, with us being a little island, it does, the, we get hit by the, uh, the sea at different places. You know, uh, on the West Coast, we get all the, the weather coming over from the Atlantic. Um, you know, the people in, on the South Coast, they can dive virtually all year round with really good viz. Uh, on our East Coast here, mm -hmm. we get a short window of probably about two or three months of really good diving where the visibility, if you get the tides right, is really clear um and then you know it's gone for the winter and the spring you know um so summertime is okay uh north england that's really nice you know that's, that's it's really good and up around scapa flow yeah so that there. can be choppy that can be choppy up there yeah it can yeah, be yeah. yeah yeah it's all about the conditions but you know we see people diving all year round which is great to see it's obviously dry suit diving this time of year but it's a uh, yeah, it's... yeah, I mean, you know, I'm I'm at an inland site here in, in Huntsville. We're up in North Alabama. So uh, a lot of the uh, instructors just take their divers to court, local rock quarries. Yeah. yeah. And um, I mean, you know, once you've been on a tropical reef and or down the Red Sea or wherever, there's just not a lot of incentive to really want to go into a rock quarry. <laughs> uh, but uh, but you can you can learn quite well uh in those as uh, you know especially if you have an old car or something to dive on you mm. know, something yeah. down there and i imagine around the uk you've got a lot of wrecks because you keep having wars and uh so you've probably got a lot of shipwrecks to, there to is on. yeah on this, there is quite a lot um and up north as well there's there's loads mm. just i think a lot of it not so much because of wars but more because of the weather yeah, I, 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 I was not being serious about that. Yeah, I get that. <laughs> the, you you have off, awful though. weather. And, yeah, uh, that's what saved channel. me from the Spanish Armada, as I recall, was really the weather. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it all adds to the variety of diving and you know, everybody can have a different um, way they can go. They might like the wrecks or they might like, you know, seeing the wildlife. It's a, it's just a, an amazing sport to be involved in, isn't it? Just really yeah, nice. and, and uh, you know, learning all, all the you talk about the wildlife, learning uh, to name the different fishes that you see. Uh, I think it's a really important aspect to it, rather than oh, I saw a fish. You know, well, what kind of fish did you see, and what was its behavior, and was that mm -hmm. unusual? Its behavior. So, so I really tried to get my students involved in understanding, um, say, the coral reef structure and understanding what kind of uh fish that were schooling like the blue tang and so on what was that and why did they do that what were the parrot fish why did they act the way that that they did why it's so exciting to see a moray uh, that is not a bad fish a moray is not a bad fish a moray is a great fish mm -hmm. um and so don't be afraid of them and uh the same thing for sharks for the most part um observing sharks is a very interesting thing to do um and um so but you do of course want to be wary around those big guys like the tiger sharks and so on um uh, but uh, but be knowledgeable of what you're actually seeing to my mind brings so much uh, more enjoyment to the sport rather than just seeing things and not really understanding what you're seeing yeah so what's your kind of thing with diving do you like seeing the wildlife more or the wrecks more have you got some kind of more of a passion for one area of diving <laughs> Well, for the longest time, it was Rex um, because I was writing about it and uh, very, very uh, curious as to, um, I mean, like most Americans, um, well, we like to say war is the way Americans learn geography, right? So um, 
But uh, we had, had no idea that the geography off North Carolina turned out to be a real choke point uh, for German U-boats during World War II. And they sank uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, our ships and uh, British ships as well, all allied ships off there uh, with about seven, I think it's seven U-boats that we sank off there. Uh, so to me, that was, um, I mean, it's not so, it's something that was taught in history classes or anything that we had this huge battle off our east coast during world war ii and yeah. some in the gulf and so uncovering that and diving all the, these old wrecks and learning about them for the longest time was really my um what i was really interested in but i also uh, started exploring down in honduras off the island called guanaja isla de guanaja ended up buying property down there, started back in the 1970s. So um, I also had that aspect to my diving as well, was exploring this island that basically been forgotten by history. And uh, I ended up doing most of the um, uh, mapping of the reef structure uh, all around Guanaja that's still in use today and learning where the good dive sites were. And uh, that was just absolute pristine diving. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just amazing. Um, I mean, most of the reef structure down in the Caribbean now has been uh, severely compromised for a lot of different reasons. Um, and, and I was lucky to be able to see it in its most pristine form. And uh, I'd love to see that type of pristine coral reef again. We have good reefs around uh, in the Virgin Islands, but they're nothing like they used to be. Mm, yeah, it's a shame to see that decline in the environment. Yeah, there's a lot of reasons for that. And that's another thing about diving is that um, you, you do get a sense of change mm. over time. So you dive the reef structure year after year um, in you don't have to be the same reef, but just in the same locale, like the Caribbean. So I can, in my mind, I can see the way it used to be. And I say, see the way it is now. It's still quite beautiful. Don't get me wrong, but I can see that there's less of it. I can see the damage. I can see the, the bleaching that's gone on. I can see where anchors have dragged through it, you know, all that kind of thing. And that puts into your mind, well, you really don't want that to happen and you want to do whatever you can to stop it and uh, to make it better. And so that's that's the, the side of diving that I think most of us serious divers take on after a while is to be very protective of what we see is really a rather fragile uh, ecosystem uh, that it wouldn't take much uh, to destroy. You know, a lot of plastic that's in the water now. We see so much plastic on the beaches and so on all around the world. So all of these things that that most people are not aware of that we actually see while we're on vacation. We see, we see yeah. these things and it, uh, it shouldn't, uh, you know, detract from enjoying diving and so on, but it is something that we need to bring back to folks that, uh, you know, there's a problem in the ocean right now. There's way too much plastic in the ocean and, uh, and we need to be thinking about recycling all this stuff and keeping it out of our, our waterways. So. Yeah. No, it's true. And, but how do you go about stopping that? You know, do, do we just pick one place at a time? You know, how, how do we stop that? How do we get the world to say, right, enough of this? Well, yeah, how do we get the world to do anything? I mean, one thing that we can do, of course, is just when when you're down in the tropics and so on is to is to if you look around people are trying to keep the beaches clean, you know, mm -hmm. volunteer uh, for a day of just walking along and picking up plastic and and um, so that's really on a personal basis mostly all that we can do is just try to keep the beaches as clean as we can and uh, keep if we see a plastic bag in the water you know tuck it in your wetsuit and uh, just get it out of the water that's all that we really can do it's it's at the national governmental level uh, to put restrictions on on plastics I'm hopeful but as usual, I think we're going to have to be gobsmacked by uh, by some <laughs> crash out in the ocean that uh, uh, loss of fisheries and so on before we uh, yeah. actually do anything. And because a lot of this has only come about in what the last twenty years, I guess. You know, yeah, I mean, a lot of it came place. about. You know, used to when I went on a hike, I carried a canteen. And I, I filled that canteen before I left. And when I came back, it was either empty. And then when I went back out, I 
got my canteen back. Well, now I use a plastic water bottle. Yeah. So that has happened in the last 20 or 30 years that all of this, um, all of a sudden they sold water in plastic bottles. And so mm -hmm. it doesn't matter where you go, you find tens of thousands <laughs> of, of bottles littering the landscape. So uh, to my mind, uh, we can go back to the way we used to be and just use canteens. We don't need all this plastic, but ultimately uh, that's something that will have to be stopped on a on a uh, government level. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's all education and educating people and any little difference we can make, you know, adds to the bigger picture, doesn't it? So I think it does. There's an impact, you know, and again, that's the wonderful thing about divers is that we are, we are working and playing in the most important system that there is on our planet. And that's our ocean system. We yeah. are aware of it. We are mm -hmm. in it. And, um, and even if we just come back and tell people how wonderful and beautiful it was, that's, uh, that's part of it. And then uh, if we see it in distress, that, that we want to do something about it. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're a very, we're a small community. Uh, scuba divers are really a small community, even, but we all relate because we all have very similar experiences and knowledge. Mm. Uh, and so we instantly relate. Yeah. Uh, we're also pretty, uh, we're not somebody that, that hotels particularly like to rent to because we're pretty nasty. We drag in awful stuff, uh, stinky wetsuits. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot of gear isn't it yeah, a lot of gear yeah. and sand and everything else so we're used to being ostracized too so that's good we're a bunch of rebels really is what we are yeah. at the end of the day it is a big community and you know that's the great thing about diving or any anything to do with diving free diving snorkeling everybody yeah. has that kind of link to the ocean system and the waters don't they yeah. yeah, I mean, you got to be a little bit adventurous just to just to think about doing it and then actually doing it. And uh, uh, of course, snorkeling, um, there are snorkelers and then there are divers. There, there's a difference. Um, yeah. And that is, you know, again, diving gets to be a lot. Uh, there's technical there's technical situations to deal with. And it's one of the things that I, 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 I am uh, distressed a little bit about diving uh, agencies uh, telling their instructors um, not to teach the technical aspects of diving very much. Uh, we're just trying to sell gear here, you know. So no, I'm I'm against that entirely. I think that there is a there is a fine line to be walked. I get that. Not every uh, diver uh, wants to know uh, how to take the regulator apart and put it back together again, but some of them do. And so um, you have to kind of, I think the instructor, I guess the bottom line is that instructors should be given more leeway than I think they are given right now uh, to teach. That if the instructor is good enough, is a, a good teacher um, that can explain these things in detail and still sell scuba gear, okay, mm -hmm. that they should be allowed to do it. But of course, a lawyer is getting involved with all of that. And I understand that too. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you teach them too much and then, then they mess up, then, uh, then it comes back on you. So show them a video and that's it. And, and uh, yeah. go on from there. I, I'm against that really. Sharing the knowledge is really important as well, isn't it? Because no one will progress if you don't have more knowledge. Yeah. And you know, it's, um, I, I think it's just so much, for me, it was so much fun to be a scuba instructor and to get to know folks and uh, to get them past perhaps some of their fears that they had and then see them enjoy what you love. Uh, to me, that was the greatest aspect of it. And uh, there, I, there are people, uh, there are hundreds of divers out there right now that put their regulator on their tank just exactly the way I taught them to do it <laughs> and, uh, you know, and uh, check their gear out just exactly like I told them to do it, to go through all those steps, uh, just like Homer told me to do it. And uh, so, so even though I'm not necessarily out there diving with them, there I'm still with them in a way. So that's yeah. Yeah. you've got a legacy out there. There's I do a little bit. Yeah. I think it's really um, 
it's, it's true what you say because if I was going to learn how to, to tech dive, say, I would rather learn off somebody who's passionate about it and they're going to teach you uh, how they learn and how they become passionate about it rather from somebody who's just seen as another course to teach and pound notes or dollars to them. I think you're going yeah. to learn more. I think you're going to uh, appreciate it more. I think you're going to appreciate the seriousness of it more. Um, and I think it will, that information will stay within you more because the course it's a passion. Is yeah. yeah i think um i think with some agencies uh and i think of one particular i don't think i'll name it i think they've got so big it's very hard for them to change and uh if for them their business model is set you know to basically teach something that can get somebody in the water reasonably safely They'll, they'll understand the, the the basic fundamentals of diving mm -hmm. and then uh, hook on and hinge on these add-ons of other courses because it's more stuff to sell. Yeah. Uh, rather yeah. than the actual passion of diving. That's and right. maybe some people, maybe some people do understand, wouldn't understand it all in one go. And maybe they do need it broken down. Um, and some agencies do go about it, I think, a lot better really and i think how you explain it is better yeah yeah and but i do understand uh, i don't like it but i do understand why um the big agencies just want you to stay within certain narrow confines on what you teach yeah. because if you teach somebody okay you can safely go down really deep and if you follow these rules and every, it's all going to be okay and then it's not for some reason then that opens uh, the instructor and everybody else open for a big uh, lawsuit so yeah. so that's why i think they they tend to uh, avoid that but uh, uh, hopefully um, the i mean we have there's wonderful instructors out there today and even though they're within these constraints if they show a passion and uh, for the diving and by example show the the techniques and the care uh, that in, that information is still imparted and then for divers who are really interested in doing deep wreck diving or really ice diving or some or nitrox mm -hmm. you know mixed gas diving and so on then um, they know the resource to go to to find that information and then um, the instructor that that can train them further uh, on that yeah. so so yeah I mean uh, uh, it's it's still happening out there it's just sometimes I think the initial the initial impulse of the agencies is to uh, be willing to train anybody no matter, even if they're not truly interested in diving, but just get them in there and sell them some gear. And yeah. um, you think about all the millions of dollars and pounds worth of gear that's sitting in somebody's closet where they only dive one time <laughs> <laughs> when they got certified, you know, uh, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's out yeah. there, but that's part, but that's true with any sport. I think. Yeah. Any, and that happens, doesn't sport. it? Yeah. yeah. But the main yeah. thing is, yeah, having a, you know, fab instructor with the same passion and you can see that you've got that amazing passion that you just want to share, which is, yeah, really, really good. Yeah, and, and that's really part of it. That's why I think that you want to be an instructor is not because you want to sell gear, it's because you want to impart to everybody that you possibly can the passion that you have for diving, uh, how much fun it is, how interesting it is, how it gives you an excuse to go to far-flung exotic places without being suspected that you're some sort of drug runner. Um, I mean, you have a purpose for going uh, to, uh, to these places. And, um, and then it, it opens you up to not just only the diving, but the, the international aspects of our sport uh, of going to these exotic locales with a purpose, with a passion, with bringing back understanding of of the seas and the reefs and the wrecks and everything else and it just makes you i think a more interesting person yeah. but also somebody that has knowledge that most people don't have and are are able to bring back because when we go on 
diving vacations. I mean, most people, they go to, they go on vacations and they, what do they do? They lay around on the beach and they go to the same tourist traps everybody else does and to the bars and all. Not that that's not fun, but they do that. Uh, but that's basically what everybody else is doing. But for divers, we go off like, <laughs> we're actually breathing underwater. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> We're seeing things that a very, very few people are ever allowed yeah. to see. Right? That's a real privilege. Yeah, it's a total privilege, and that, um, and that's one of the reasons I loved writing about it. You know, uh, uh, so in Torpedo Junction, uh, the newest book, by the way, is one called "Don't Blow Yourself Up," which includes all of my diving experiences. Um, and part of not blowing myself up was diving on these U-boat wrecks, which were loaded with eighty-eight millimeter shells. Uh, wow live and torpedoes yeah and uh so we were lucky that we didn't blow ourselves up uh, so with uh 352 uh, what made you go to that one well the u352 was um was discovered uh accidentally in the early 1970s when a trawler's net got caught on it and it was sitting in 110 feet of water um and um within the gulf stream yeah and so uh, when the, the, they knew that they had snagged a wreck and they wanted to see what it was, so that they sent divers down on it, just local uh, spear fishermen, and they reported that it was some sort of submarine. And um, so some folks at the University of North Carolina thought, well, you know, that could be a, actually, it's it, it, are you sure it's not the monitor, which is uh, the first ironclad? It's yeah. sunk out in, in nearly the same area. Looks a lot like a submarine. And they were going, no, it's a submarine. And so the divers went down on and 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 some of the initial um, research indicated that it might be the U-352 because most of the crew of the U-352 survived. And so there was a historical record of this and actually sailors over in Germany that, that knew about this. So there had been maybe, oh, a dozen dives on it by the time I got to it. And um, I, I had done enough research by then that I recognized not only that it was a German U-boat, but it was a type seven. Uh, and uh, that, and also that it's, it was missing its uh, deck gun, which had been reported blown off. And so what the censure was, I found a skeleton in the conning tower. And so, um, which according to Rathke, the commandant, the captain of the U-boat, uh, he had lost a, a crew member in, uh, it was killed trying to get out of the conning tower by the Coast Guard vessel that was shooting at it. And so all of these things indicated that this was the U-352. So it was a matter of doing all the research at that point was why was the U-352 there? What Coast Guard cutter sank it? What had it done? And uh, that led to uh, the U-85, which was not in the Gulf. Well, again, the Gulf Stream was beautiful. It's beautiful, clear, tropical-like water, tropical fishes all around it beautiful photography so it was kind of the perfect place to work on him though it was quite deep um and then uh the u85 uh was the next one that was discovered uh about the same depth but outside of the gulf stream so that was deep deep dark dirty cold gray <laughs> ugly water um but i did a lot of research on it as well so uh, that's that's what got me up there yeah, that's really interesting. So that's all in your new book. People can have a... Yeah, yeah. yeah don't blow yeah. yourself up, uh, which um, includes my time in Vietnam and also right. my time working with uh, with NASA. And um, uh, that was my mom's advice when I told her I was going to build rockets. She said, well, don't blow yourself up. So it's good uh, advice. It's, <laughs> and you it survive. Really yeah. is good advice when you it stop is. to think about it. It really <laughs> is. No matter what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> no matter what. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we'll put the link to the book in the show notes so that people can click on that and then uh, take that a bit further and hopefully, yeah. So. Yeah, great. Thank they can go out to homerhickam.com. That's my website and they can find it out there. So. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So we obviously have some set questions we always ask our guests. So the first one is if you could take three people diving, they don't have to be divers, but it's just to take them diving to show them that underwater worlds. They can be past, present. Who would you take and why? I take Vladimir Putin and I'd leave him there. 
<laughs> That'd Funny be the enough, first, first time we've had him. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would. Um, Get your well, uh, hmm. so for anybody else, uh, I mean, I think it, it is, it would be great to take some of our uh, politicians. Mm. Wouldn't it have been fun to dive with Maggie Thatcher? <laughs> I think now, she would have been so brave. Another controversial <laughs> figure. Great. I mean, if we're talking politicians, that would be fun, a fun one to, to take. Um, and uh, I don't know. Um, it'd be great to uh, to go back and uh, dive with Jacques Cousteau. Mm. Uh, I mean, my goodness. Uh, what a showman he was and how he really opened up the sport to, to everybody. I would have loved to have followed him and his team around in their aluminum suit and uh everything that they had so uh, yeah. so that, that would have been the calypso i calypso i would have loved to have gone diving with john denver also speaking of uh, calypso yeah uh he would have been fun i never got to meet john uh he sang about my home state take me home country roads yeah. west virginia yeah. right uh he would have been fun yeah, good, oh, well, good great choices. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Varied choices, which is great. Very various, yes. <laughs> I've never had John Denver before, but good choice. I like it. I like his music. Yeah. Um, okay, so we like to give our listener a bit of a nugget. Um, could be for life, doesn't have to be about diving. Um, something along that you've kind of learned, really. And um, would you have something for our listener as, as a nugget to take away from this interview? Well, my dad used to say it's better to confess ignorance than provide it. And so um, if you're going to be a diver, uh, you should not be ignorant about your sport. You should really dig into it and learn all its aspects. Uh, that makes you a safer diver, a better diver, a better yeah. buddy. Um, and also um, as a uh, one little nugget I can give you is that every so often you should practice out of air situation yes. um, because that should be a routine thing on what you do in an out of air situation. If you're with a buddy that has an octopus mm -hmm. regulator or one that doesn't or without one. Um, and so what do you do? So every so often you should practice out of air situations. Yeah. Uh, that is a very good point. Gemma, when did we last practice that? No, exactly. And we've had previous guests that say most times when they get in the water, they'll always practice maybe one skill just to yeah. keep that. And I think we're all very guilty that we don't always do that yeah. when we get in the water. And some, so. when you're not in the water that often as well even more importantly, when you get back yeah. in. You should. Yeah, and you know, there's, a, there's another way to train and that is to think your way through it. And so even if you, if you feel, well, you know, you're going with a bunch of tourist divers and you don't want to be dropping your weight belt and blowing little bubbles and headed toward yeah. the surface, just because it was a good thing to practice because everybody's going to freak out, right? Um, you can think your way through it and just, go, what, what, what am I going Steps. to do? To, yeah. to, to be, it's called, in the military, it's called situational awareness. Yeah. So you should check yourself every once in a while. Now, as an instructor, unfortunately, or fortunately, I'm always in instructor mode. I don't care who I'm with. I'm always looking out after everybody else. And I just can't help it. I just do. I just pay attention to what everybody's doing. I want to check their air. I don't care who they are. I want to look at that, that pressure gauge to see where you are. Uh, so that's just the way I am. But if you mentally think your way through an emergency situation, quite often you're prepared, you're as prepared, almost as prepared as actually practicing it, as long as you've done it uh, before, you know, actually practiced it before. Yeah, that's really good advice. It is. Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, next time we go diving, we should practice that as mm -hmm. an out there. Yeah. 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 So, um, so yeah, the, of course, the easiest thing to do is just grab the octopus and uh, breathe off of it, which is good. Except that 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 can you know all of a sudden, if you do that, grab grab somebody's octopus and start breathing off of it. What do they first thing they do? They feel a little tug. They turn around, right? They start mm -hmm. turning around. Yeah, so you're, you're basically it. trying to go around with them. The next thing you know, you're just spinning around. So that's why you got to kind of work it out with your buddy 
uh, how we're going to do this. And that I'm, I'm going to make you aware that I'm about to use your octopus rather than just grab it. So, um, so there, there are things to be worked out sure. and talked about. As much as you don't want to do it, you just want to go diving. Sometimes you need to talk it out with your, especially somebody that you don't know and you've never died with before. Yeah. Um, and, and that's the that's probably when it doesn't happen. When you're prepared is when it doesn't. Ha- it seems like things happen when you're not prepared for yeah. it. So yeah. Yeah. Stay prepared. Be prepared, like the Boy Scouts used to say. Right? <laughs> yeah. 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 No, great <laughs> advice. Yeah. Um, so the final question is if you had a billboard that the whole world could see. So it could have a statement, a video on, an image. What would you put on the billboard? What would your, be, what would your message be to the world? Well, um, just be nice to each other. I mean, really, what does it take to be nice to somebody? Um, that's ultimately it. Be nice, be polite. Yeah. Yeah. I was on a, a flight, I remember, with a, a lady. I was actually, I'd been to um, I'd been to Israel, as a matter of fact, I think it was. And I was flying back, and there was a nice lady from London or somewhere sitting beside me, and we were talking, and she said, I never, I thought all you Americans were, were brash and, uh, and kind of... Uh, kind of loud you're you're nice <laughs> and i said well you're nice too and you know that's what it's all about is just um, yeah. be nice and polite to everybody unless they're shooting at you and then you maybe you know, start yeah. <laughs> yeah be nice to the planet as well yeah. be nice to the planet absolutely yeah i mean ultimately that's what it's all about right is um is be civilized yeah yeah, no, true words, very true words, yeah. So if people want to- I don't to- know how you put all that on a, bull, a, a billboard though, just Homer says, be nice. Well, exactly, simple. <laughs> Keep it simple, yeah. <laughs> Keep it simple, it's easy, it translates <laughs> easy. It's a, yeah, so if people want to find out more about you and your books you've written, where's the best place for them to go and- uh, Yeah, yeah uh, Jim, they can go to homerhickam.com. It's spelled H-I-C-K-A-M homerhickam.com and uh, I'm uh, my uh, my family came from uh, England by the way so I think there are a lot of Hickams in the phone book right Uh, so yeah we were chased out in the early 1700s we uh, apparently they chased them to Ireland the the Irish weren't having it either (laughs) (laughs) they kept chasing them until we ended up in West Virginia (laughs) Oh, well, it's good to know you've got your roots here. Yeah. Yeah, That's true. I, I love the UK. I love, I love London. I'm, I'm an Anglophile for sure. I love being over there. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, could live, I could live happily yeah. in oh, uh, the UK. So. Well, hopefully one day you'll get to do some diving, either on our coastline or some of our inland lakes. Yeah. That would be cool. That would yeah. be great. Yeah. 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 Yep, we're I could dive Loch Ness and maybe see the monster. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did go to Loch Ness one time, and I I, uh, I didn't see the monster until I took a shower that night and found a big tick on my side. So that was the Loch Ness monster for me. It's a, <laughs> a real blood sucker. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but even something you know really lovely is like diving with the seals, either in the Farne yeah. Islands or Lindy. So yeah. Oh gosh, that. that would be great. Or the Shetlands. Yeah. I wonder what that have you guys dived the Shetlands? I wonder what that'd be like. No. Yeah. It, looks, it looks pretty rough. Yeah, um, the uh, there's a there's a mystery show that we watch called The Shetlands that uh, I think is actually filmed in Scotland, but anyway, um, it looks like pretty rough water out there. Yeah, yeah. but I bet it'd be fun to dive in. I bet it's really, really, really <laughs> <Hold deep. on. laughs> Yeah, yeah no, it's, well, it's been really lovely to hear about your story, and I'm that sure has. people will be yeah super interested to hear your journey. Yeah, yeah. Well, that new great. Book. Well, well, thank you for having me, and thank you for having this podcast, which serves uh, divers uh, all around the world. And uh, it's been well, lovely talking coming to you. on. Thanks for giving yeah. us your time. It's been brilliant. My pleasure. My yeah. pleasure. Yeah, and do keep in touch. Yeah, because it's always great to make these connections, and yeah, you never know where they go. Yeah, we're going to keep on diving. So hopefully we'll still have some adventures. And uh, so so you guys need to come over um, and come to space camp and go diving in the underwater astronaut trainer. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Could you get us in? It is fun. It really is fun. 
Yeah, book us in. <laughs> yeah, if you can get us in, that'd be awesome. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, be mini astronauts for a bit. Yeah. <laughs> there you go, hang out with the astronauts. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. that'd be awesome. Yeah, no, that's been really good. And uh, yeah, we thank you very much. And uh, yeah, wish you a lot. Well, thank you, Gemma and Ian. Yeah. It was a, a pleasure. Yeah, so. great. Okay. I wish you every success for your new book as well, Homer. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. That's okay. Right. All right. Lovely to see you. See you again. All right. Cheers. Thanks see again. You. Bye. Bye. -bye. Oh, right, we're back. So, um, <laughs> a bit surprised at finish. We uh, a bit stumped. I know, yes. Well, I wakey, that. wakey. That was really good. That's good. I hope you all enjoyed that too. Yep, that was Homer Hickman. So, uh, links to his book are in the show notes. And, uh, yep, we look forward to following his progress. He's been involved a lot, involved a lot, a lot of stuff, hasn't he, mm, over yeah. the years? Yeah, and particularly with his space and, yeah. It just yeah. shows you, though, don't know how, like, in how diving gets involved in science and you know how that's then progressed over the years whole cross section of... you know and help man get to the moon exactly thanks to diving. <laughs> so how cool is that and yeah. uh, what say thanks to homer for get you know coming on and sparing some of his time yeah that was really good so what have we got coming up in our next episode we're going to be doing a bit of a roving report from yeah. stony cove Woo, diving. <laughs> can't wait looking forward to it, getting back in the water yeah so that will be um next weekend we'll be diving and then the episode that comes out will be just a bit we haven't dived since what november no we west. have had one dive this year it was really cold wasn't it when oh, we took the right. we took masks the yeah yeah yeah, yeah. We took so, the yeah so hopefully it'll be a bit warmer yeah that was so what was that end of march wasn't it mm. yeah i have to have a look and see but yeah it was cold wasn't it yeah yeah, yeah. six yeah. degrees five yeah. degrees so <laughs> i think it's about nine degrees so after the go diving show so it's the beginning That's of right. march yeah 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 so, right. so that was a while ago so we'll be doing a few little snippets from no, our... it wasn't it was the first of march i remember now it's before the go diving show <laughs> Okay, we've, we've, we've seen your known. moments. <laughs> Where are Speak we? Speak for yourself in the senior moments. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> so anyway. Just because you're sliding down the fireman's pole tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did hear that right. Jen no. was going for the fire brigade to slide down the fireman's pole. <laughs> Our coast guards are going for Where a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Coast guards are going for a visit to our local fire station. So it's all yes. hoses and fireman's poles and things. Yeah. Anyway, Very so swiftly. <laughs> what's on the next week's episode? Oh, we're going to have a little um, extract as well from another author we've spoken to. His name's Jeff Lucas. Yeah. So there'll be a little um, interval with him speaking about his book uh, yeah. that's out there. Yeah, so that'd be good. Uh, but main thing is that'll be about you know, feedback from diving at Stony. Yes, yeah, so looking forward to that. And then we'll be in the pool. Uh, we're doing a bit more work. The week after, yeah. yeah. So, so, so we've got lots planned. Yeah, lots coming up. And hopefully as yes, the weather changes on the water too. Yeah, up. it'll be a bit warmer. And then there is a little bonus episode coming out as well. So oh, watch yes. this space. So we had our previous guest, Ethan. Um, she'd written a book about Corey and his adventures underwater. Yeah. So we're just going to read a little bit of an extract from the book and yeah. encourage you to have a look at the website and maybe make a donation. Yeah, do that. That'd be really good. Look, for, look out for that. Uh, I think that's kind of covered us yep, for this week. Uh, so next episode will be out next week. Yes and uh, tune in for that but right now that was the Big Scuba Podcast yes and if you want to make contact with us or any comments get them on our social media you know where to go see you soon see you soon bye now that does wrap up today's episode of the Big Scuba Podcast but if you want to hear more from the podcast make sure you hit that subscribe or follow button depending on what platform you are listening on that way you will never miss an episode from us but if you are listening on Apple Podcasts and did enjoy what you heard today, we would really appreciate it if you head to the show page to leave a five-star rating and review. It really does help us. If you do, please take a screenshot of that review and send it to us on Instagram and we'll give you a shout out to say a big thank you. If you have any questions for us, or anything that has been mentioned in today's episode, be sure to reach out to us on any of our social media platforms or send us an email. The links are in the show notes. We will get back to you no matter what. 
If you have made it to this point in the episode, we both want to say a big, big thank you for tuning in and we'll see you on the next episode.